right. So for those who are here for the first time, um, I don't know if you've been, all been following on YouTube or maybe on some of the videos afterwards, but uh, we go through this lovely, wonderful book, uh, which is getting rather dog-eared, my own personal copy. It's also got two lovely stickers on look from the Empty Cloud Monastery in New Jersey of bikunis. You don't often see bikunis depicted in any drawings. So um, yes, it doesn't come with the stickers, but it's a very nice book. <laughs> And uh, today we are still on proper speech. We might actually finish the chapter on speech. It's only a small one. And it's quite an interesting part of this chapter. A little bit, again, counterintuitive perhaps for some, because it talks about assigning praise and blame. And the Buddha gives his um, teachings and his um, uh, advice for us to assign praise and blame not not to but actually how to and that it may even be more beneficial than just staying quiet which i find quite radical and and very um quite comforting too because there can be such a thing as a, a mission to speak a mission to act you know especially when it comes to perhaps standing up for others or maybe when it comes to not using our discernment as well as we might you know so i think for me this shows the buddha sort of lauding discernment even more than necessarily saying what people want to hear right it's more important to know what's right and wrong what's good and bad what's beneficial and unbeneficial and perhaps it also relates a little bit to wise friendship knowing the kind of people to associate with and the ones not to do and again it's never a personal thing that this person's bad you know we don't want to um assign blame to the person themselves because there is really nothing but a process going on it's more about noticing and praising behavior that's praiseworthy worthy, or blaming behavior that's blameworthy. So it's kind of part of a bigger collage. So any of these little excerpts have to sit in the whole framework of the suttas overall. And the more that we learn and the more that we can kind of relate them to each other, the bigger picture we get. So it becomes a really incredible guide for our lives and something that's very experimental i would say something that you know we can't really get it right it's something that's an ongoing practice and that's also why i like this um advice of the buddha to speak right rather than just to stay quiet there were times for staying quiet of course but there are also there's this very rich practice of learning how to use speech as a tool for the path and learning how to use speech to bring more harmony and happiness um, and benefit to others and to ourselves. <clears throat> so speech can be, you know, a tool for harm, a lot of harm. And sometimes, you know, we just wish we could kind of take the words we'd said and put them back in our mouth, right? <laughs> because words can really hurt. They can really cut us. And yet words can heal as well. So it's an ongoing thing. And I think, you know, of all the precepts, even including the bhikkhu and the bhikkhuni vinaya, the training precepts that we have, um, which are quite involved, I think often speech is the one that we do well to look more closely at uh, because so much can be expressed with speech. And, you know, it also gives us the opportunity to express things like respect. You know, some of the, the Vinaya is very obvious. Some of it's around the time that you eat at, for example, or um, the physical conduct that you do where there's an obvious kind of that you either did it or you didn't do it right but other parts are a lot subtler such as showing disrespect is an offense to be confessed so this is much more nuanced and we really have to start looking inside our mind to see where we're coming from to see our motivations our dispositions towards others and towards life um, so it's a very very rich field of practice and of course right speech is part of the eightfold path so without any further uh, discussion and introduction from me, I would like to start reading out these little suttas and also just encourage you not to take this as a lecture from someone who knows everything about speech, but to take it as an opportunity to share what you've learned, what how you practice, maybe mistakes that you've made or any doubts that you have, and just bring it to life a little bit with real life experiences and examples. So you're welcome to raise your hand at any time. Uh, we might not come to you immediately if I'm in the middle of uh, a very important thought, <laughs> according to myself. Um, but we will, I will pause from time to time also and um, 
and take those questions or invite questions if you haven't raised your hand. So, and when you do speak, uh, you will not be, your video won't be recorded. That stays on my face the whole time. <laughs> so I'm the one that, like Ajahn Pham says, is uh, it's like the windscreen takes all the bugs and flies <laughs> and whatever else you want to throw at the windscreen of a car. Um, so you'll be protected in that way, but your voice would be recorded, which is always very helpful for others, I think, to hear different people engaging. But if you prefer, for not to, you can also write any question in the chat. Okay. But I think it brings it to life and it helps the community kind of bond a little bit if we hear one another. And uh, we can also give one another, you know, feedback as well. It doesn't only have to be teacher centric. So, are we ready for the sutta? <laughs> Excellent. So, this is on page 80. And this little paragraph is called Assigning Praise and Blame. And most of the time, uh, this is the Buddha speaking to the monastic Sangha. And uh, usually he's addressing monks, perhaps because the monk Sangha is generally more senior in the sense that they started before the Bhikkhuni Sangha. But it is not meant to exclude anyone at all. This is the Dhamma, which is universal. So I shall say, uh, I shall say community most of the time. Community possessing five qualities. A resident monk is deposited in hell as if brought there. What five? Number one, without investigating and scrutinizing, one speaks praise of one who deserves dispraise. Number two, without investigating and scrutinizing, one speaks dispraise of one who deserves praise. Number three, without investigating and scrutinizing, one believes a matter that merits suspicion. Number four, without investigating and scrutinizing, one is suspicious about a matter that merits belief. So these so far are all about getting things rather wrong, aren't they? <laughs> And uh, some sort of problem here with our investigative and powers and our uh, ability to scrutinize things using wise discernment. Um, so to me, it's already kind of raising those two qualities of our mind, you know, the investigation part of the practice and part of wisdom as fairly important here. And it's also about kind of misinterpreting things that happen, right? Believing things that merit suspicion or being suspicious about things that merit belief. So we're confused, right? The hindrance of doubt is there. In fact, in both of those cases, we could see that as a, a hindrance of doubt. Yeah. And then the last one is very different. So I'm quite curious about how this one is here, because number five is that one squanders what has been given out of faith. So that's not directly related to speech, but it does show a kind of disposition, perhaps of disrespect, right? Not really appreciating what's been given, not really honoring um, the donor's intentions and uh, being rather careless. So possessing these five qualities, it says here a resident monk, but it could be anybody, is deposited in hell as if brought there. So I find this quite interesting. I think there's, we'll discuss it a bit further soon, but I think there's also an element here again of harmony and the importance of harmony. So if we're praising people who deserve dispraise, this is going to create problems in community. People are gonna get confused and maybe um, get the wrong idea about other people, right? Or maybe you're going to bring in people that are maybe less than wholesome in their intentions and we're not noticing that. So that can have a really detrimental effect on a group. And similarly, speaking this praise of one deserving praise, to me also could indicate a lack of ability to really um, recognize those with wisdom, those with good qualities that we should be aiming for or emulating. Right. 
And of course, spiritual friendships, the whole of the holy life. So it's important that we can recognize who we should listen to, who we should follow, you know, the kind of qualities that are going to help us on the path and those that aren't. And then, of course, the opposite holds true as well. So community, possessing five qualities. A person is deposited in heaven as if brought there. What five? Number one, having investigated and scrutinized, one speaks dispraise of one who deserves dispraise. So right away, that kind of overturns this sense of right speech always being saying what's good and pleasing, right? Speaking dispraise of one who deserves dispraise can actually bring you to a heavenly state. So it's curious, isn't it? I'd be interested to see what you think about why. And then number two, having investigated and scrutinized, one speaks praise of one who deserves praise. Number three, having investigated and scrutinized, one is suspicious about a matter that merits a suspicion. Number four, having investigated and scrutinized, one believes a matter that merits belief. And number five, one does not squander what's been given out of faith. Possessing these five qualities, a person is deposited in heaven as if brought there. Hmm. So something else stood out to me there about um, all of this pertaining to being able to walk the right path, right? Because we're investigating and scrutinizing and understanding what's worthy of dispraise and praise. So we're likely to have good friends, right? We're likely to avoid... Um, matters that are problematic we can uh, be suspicious about the right things and have trust in the right things too and then not squandering what we've been given also means that we'll have those requisites especially for monastics we'll have the right supports to continue our practice so perhaps this is really all the kinds of qualities we need to really walk the path because obviously if we don't know what that path is we're going to be confused and make mistakes so I don't know what anybody thinks about this, um, especially about the dispraise. Like it takes a bit of courage, doesn't it, sometimes to speak dispraise of something that deserves dispraise. And maybe there's right and wrong times to do that. It would be um, very interesting to hear what you think. If you have any comments or questions so far, um, please raise your hands. Okay, Veronica. Um, Bill, lovely. Veronica and Sally as well, wonderful. Hi, Veronica. Hi. Something that immediately came up in my mind about this praise of one who deserves this praise is that if you you really have investigated and and found that that you are actually protecting other people from falling into the trap of um, being led astray by this particular person. Yes, yes, absolutely. And as you say, that having investigated and scrutinized is so important, you know, because we discovered something that we feel might be worth sharing right to protect others as you say and maybe it even might help the person who mm. deserves this praise depending on you know how it's done but perhaps if everybody would approach that person and this does happen in the suttas to say listen you know you're going the wrong way we want to approach you out of compassion because your behavior is not in line with the path then perhaps that person might understand mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah you're offering them the opportunity to change, develop, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, that's really true. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Uh, can you hear you? You should be able to speak now, Sally. Hello? Hi, we can hear you. Who, me? Sally? Yes, yes. Okay, right, fine, sorry. 
I'll just introduce myself. My name is Sally. I'm in Eastbourne on the south coast and I'm new to this and I'm new to Zoom. So that's why we're having those problems. But anyway, my thoughts when you were talking about um, dispraise was that yes, it does present the opportunity for the person you're dispraising to grow, to take on board the dispraise and perhaps change for the good. But my life experience so far has been that it often can have the reverse effect, that the person becomes very defensive, aggressive, and you're into this potential conflict situation, which I don't find heavenly, I find hellish. Yes. Uh, the more so as I get older, actually, my tolerance for conflict has reduced or reduced, so that I try and avoid it. Mm -hmm. and my, I think my way of avoiding it is trying not to engage with people like that at yes. all and yes. trying to avoid them. Mm -hmm. So I'd be interested to know what you think about that. Yeah, I think that's absolutely important. And I'm learning that as well, little by little. Um, it's important for me to have boundaries when I'm in this particular role, because people do come with all kinds of um, reasons, different reasons. And of course, there can be a lot of projections as well, especially on monastics who are supposed to be available and compassionate. And, mm. you know, people will have expectations of someone in this role. So I found that that's actually really important. And I think uh later on if we get to it today there'll be another sutta that actually does um give us a lot of advice for giving somebody feedback directly and one of the advisors is to only give feedback to those who will not display anger and will not be troublesome for us will basically not cause us problems so the buddha actually doesn't advise us to give feedback to people who can't take it because it's problematic for us and it doesn't really help them so my understanding of this particular passage is that it's not necessarily speaking dispraise to the person we want to dispraise. It's more speaking, um, dispraising the behavior in general. So it could be even, you know, sometimes we think we shouldn't say things about others to our friends, but I understand this more as uh, possibly um, saying that if we see something that's kind of, uh, we feel that somebody else needs to be alerted to we could maybe mention that to a trusted friend and say well this person has been known to I don't know maybe manipulate and just be careful you know just have your boundaries and and take care um, but only to do that if you have really scrutinized and investigated and that has been shown to be true and I would say if you can really trust the other person to perhaps take that on board because otherwise, of course, it can cause more division and everyone gets confused. And some people go onto the side of the perpetrator or the manipulative person, which can happen mm. sometimes. Mm. So it's very delicate. But I would probably always suggest, as I said in the introduction, to more look at behaviors than people. So to more sort of praise or dispraise behaviors, you know. So there's another sutta by the Buddha, the Arana Vibhanga Sutta. And in there, it says that we always talk in terms of Dhamma, not in terms of individuals. So, for example, we would say um, acting with aggression is the wrong way and leads to harm rather than people who are aggressive cause mm. harm. So it's more about principles like dispraising things that aren't leading to wholesomeness and goodness. Um, which I think is much more important. And I think you're doing that in the sense that you've, for yourself, dispraised people who maybe attack back and you've decided to uh, that that's worthy of dispraise and so you've removed yourself from it. Mm. So I think that is actually probably the product of the investigation scrutiny. Yeah. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, can we come to Meg next? Hi, oh, thank you. This is also my first time. I'm delighted to be here. I'm intrigued uh, by the last line in the first two parts of uh, wasting a gift that has been given in faith, because the first four exhortations in both parts require that we have a very substantial amount of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And then we come to the end 
And there's something about not wasting a gift given in faith. What, what might be this gift given in faith? Okay, yeah. Well, I think that in this context, because the Buddha is talking to the monastic Sangha, it's around um, developing feelings of gratitude and maybe understanding the purpose of why gifts are given as well. So, I mean, I also find it curious that it's in there, you know, because this is around speech. But to me, it seems to be related to, you know, first of all, developing wisdom and investigation and um, the powers of discernment. And then perhaps it's to do with being able to uh, also discern gifts and their purpose, right? So in this case, for monastics, most of those gifts would revolve around uh, shelter or food, medicines. Um, and what's the other one? shelter, food, medicines, and robes, so something to cover the body. So I would suggest that it still involves uh, discernment about how to use them wisely and how to use them frugally, but also that sense of respect and gratitude, because without these requisites as a monastic, we can't practice the path. So as to why it's in the list, I really couldn't say. But to me, it's all about you know, the Buddha's talking about how to, how you might end up in hell, right? Or how you might go to heaven. And of course, the Buddha's path is nothing to do with believing in a higher power. It's more to do with um, the way we live our lives. So, of course, we have to be able to use the supportive conditions wisely in order to develop that wisdom. So I guess that might be why it's there. I'm not quite sure. But, yeah. I have, so, um, you know, uh, yeah. thinking of it, how, how it might be for me is that I've been given this path. Mm -hmm. I've, I, this is a great gift, and it's been given, the, the teacher who gave it to me gave it to me in faith. They have faith in me that I was worthy of walking this beautiful path. Beautiful. And uh, I, I think, uh, for me, that's what it means, that it, 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 the path is not easy, and I think right speech is perhaps the most challenging of the Eightfold Path for many of us. Mm -hmm. And it requires an enormous amount of discernment and investigation, but really that's all based on wisdom. So it's a very, we're talking about a very advanced practice here. And this is the reason that I love to hang out with monastics is because you monastics take this to such an extent of putting it into practice that it's really an inspiration for, for the rest of us. So thank you very much. Oh, bless you. And thank you for your wonderful comments. I think you took that much deeper. And uh, that is the most precious gift of all. I mean, when I think about the things that I'm most grateful for in my life, basically it's number one, finding the Dhamma, finding the path. And number two, it's my teachers. Yeah, absolutely. Those who really embody the path and give that encouragement to walk it. So, yeah, without that, we can't make much progress at all, right? Thank you. It's wonderful. Can we come to Al now? Well, can you unmute, please? Hi. 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 Yeah, I'm, I'm Al. I'm from uh, London. You wouldn't tell it from the accent, but I actually live in London. Uh, okay. the, yeah, the, the, the one thing that troubles me about the, the two outcomes between heaven and hell is that it seems to be based on judgment, you know, making a, a judgment and getting a judgment right. And I was quite troubled with that mm -hmm. until you said something about the qualities, that it seems to me that you're judging not the person, but the qualities, wholesome and unwholesome qualities of the person. No, that's it. I think that's the difference, isn't it? Because qualities, I think all of us can understand that qualities change, they shift, they can grow, they can you know, diminish. They're not fixed things. And the trouble when we talk in terms of people is that we tend to have that self-view that sees people as fixed things, fixed entities. And there's not a lot of room for growth. You know, we don't give others room for growth if we judge them outright and say, well, you're like this, you can never change, you know, then of course they're not going to change. In order to change, we need to have wise teachers or we need to have some kind of confidence in ourselves that, um, that encourage our good qualities um, and that 
you know, by recognizing those qualities and by other people pointing them out, maybe praising the good in us, it does encourage it to grow. And I think that's why it's important to praise what's praiseworthy as well. And hopefully by, you know, dispraising what's dispraiseworthy, it will encourage us to drop those things, especially if it's done in a skillful way. So it's all about how it's done as well. And of course, this little sutta is only uh, talking about praise and, and dispraise and that discernment quality. But there are others that talk a lot about how to give that feedback in a wise way to the individual. So, yeah, I do think it's not black and white at all. And uh, from these sort of the way they're sort of pointed out is looking at kind of worst case scenario, best case scenario, I think. So it's like if a person repeatedly makes those wrong decisions or, you know, isn't able to distinguish wholesome from unwholesome, right from wrong, then they're not going to progress on the path. Yeah. Um, and, and because of that, they will reap suffering. So hell isn't necessarily a place, but it's like a state of mind that's going to continue to suffer without that discerning wisdom yeah 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 Yeah, thanks for that it is i I also find it difficult with the words heaven and hell um just because we have that kind of christian understanding too in our culture of them being sort of places that you go to forever but in buddhist cosmology there's no place that's forever and you know you could imagine them as places but i think they're very much internal states that we can experience here and now as well yeah Felix, can we come to you? Uh, we've got a question in the chat. Would you like me to read it after Felix is? Sure, sure. that would be lovely. Felix, we'll I'll ask you to first. unmute, Felix. Can you please unmute? Uh, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think you should be audible. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, it's my first. Um, Welcome. Meeting and, yeah, I'm very honored to be here. Thank oh. you. Um, my, my, the question I was um, I would like to ask is um, the Sutta talks about uh, investigating and uh, scrutinizing, and I was wondering uh, what does it really mean? How does one do that? Because it seemed very important to do. Right. That. Good question. Really great question. Yeah, investigating and scrutinizing. It's an interesting one because the Buddha most of the time talks about investigating ourselves. And I do think that's probably the basis for being able to investigate and scrutinize others. Um, He definitely encourages us to look far more of the time at ourselves, to understand our own mind and the way we cause suffering for ourselves and the way we can release some of that suffering and actually generate goodness and happiness for ourselves than to look at others, because obviously we can't control others and we don't really know what's going on for others. But I've kind of noticed in my own practice that the more I see my own mind and mental patterns and the more I can kind of open up to the various emotions and moods and habit patterns in the mind, the more I have an understanding of others as well. Um, And I can see, for example, when they're feeling a bit stressed, there'll be certain signs that show that on their face. And I can kind of resonate with that due to my own self-awareness developing. So perhaps it's something similar to that, that, you know, we become more sensitive in ourselves as to what's worthy of praise and dispraise. And then bit by bit, we start to kind of gravitate towards people who are similar to us or who are developing similar qualities. And we can kind of notice when things are a bit off. And maybe we can notice even from being around some people that it doesn't have a very good effect on us, right? The sort of you might leave feeling drained or you might leave feeling confused, thinking, did this person tell me the truth? You know. Um, but I think it's really important, like you say, to investigate and scrutinize over a period of time because, you know, people are in different moods at different times of the day, especially if you're hormonal like I am, like perimenopause time. I, I just want to say that because women never talk about this, but it's a thing, okay? And <laughs> it's, that time is for me right now. So my moods can go up and down all day, not really in terms of hopefully how I behave overtly or my sealer, hopefully, but certainly my energy levels and kind of whether I'm happy or negative. Um, so scrutinizing means over a long period of time. And the Buddha also tells us to investigate, for example, our teachers, you know, to really watch them and see if their behavior and their 
uh, verbal conduct is in accord with their uh, what they preach. And, you know, not to expect perfection because very few people are perfect. And even the Buddha was fully enlightened, right? He's got no defilements, but people still found fault. So we'll always find petty faults, but it's really about, you know, look for the person's virtue, I would say, you know, look for that um, and look over a long period of time. Sometimes it's really, um, I've, what I've noticed actually is that there are certain people I just feel at ease around and there's a sense of trust quite quickly. And I've asked myself, what is it that gives me that sense of ease and trust? And I realized it's a person's virtue. You know, it's normally the people who are very harmless and who do really kind of take care of others and look out for ways they can serve or help that I tend to feel at ease around. Um, so, yeah, looking over a long period of time and uh, learning more about ourselves. Yeah, just two ideas, but there will be many more. <laughs> It'd be interesting to explore that as well. Thank you. Is that sort of some way answer? some sort of points and tips yeah thank you excellent <laughs> great thank you very much um yeah shelly had offered to read out the question thank you that will save my eyes i had an ex i'll read out this question or, or comment um i had an experience with a professional who falsely accused me of something was aggressive towards me and ex exhibited unethical behavior posting some things on social media to get people on their side i've debated reporting the behaviors to a state agency that regulates the profession sorry the person will know i reported them and i would risk further aggression in my small community i'm also concerned that they will cause hot i think it means harm to others and i want to protect others that they may harm Mm. that's a really complex and disturbing situation definitely and i think it takes a lot of courage to report a person and obviously you're doing that from a sense of wanting to protect others which is right intention you know so you are taking a risk there for yourself because it may cause you know more aggression but at the same time not to act due to fear is not a good thing you know we have to be courageous um and you know sometimes calling things out so i do think that even if you know other people might not believe you straight away or might get more aggression towards you in the end people tend to see through these things and they tend to um heed people's advice so i would say you know be very clear about your intention and keep on taking refuge in that you know anytime you feel nervous or anxious it's like i'm doing the right thing i'm trying to you know take a decision based on wanting to protect others wanting to you know prevent harm um and yeah sometimes that's difficult so to have a lot of self-compassion as well and maybe to surround yourself with people that really trust you and that you can trust you know, maybe don't tell everybody about this, but tell people that will believe you because they know you quite well. What I've noticed in my role is that if something difficult happens with a person, which it does, um, because human interaction is one of the most complicated aspects of our lives, isn't it? Um, that people who've known me for a long time have a much bigger context for what I'm saying. And they know that I wouldn't say something if it wasn't, you know, really true or if it wasn't they kind of know right that if i say something bad then it actually is because they might know me for example as not necessarily moaning about every little thing um so or they would know that i'm quite circumspect before i do say something i do kind of check things out for a long period of time and give people quite a lot of chance so it's good to talk to the people who trust you and who you really trust and maybe just point to the behavior, right? So that it doesn't start to feel, so no one doubts that you're being, that you're acting for others' benefit um, rather than just backbiting or, or, you know, perpetuating any harm. So I think it's very much about how you uh, talk about it and the way you've done that in the in the little comment here is very skillful. You know, you've been saying what the behavior was 
um, and what they exhibited. So you're talking about actual facts, um, what they did rather than who they are or where they're coming from. And that's very skillful, I would say. So I just wish you the best. Um, and yeah, I think you've taken are you you've taken an action through bravery and through good intention. So see if you can invest in that. Yeah. Yeah, it's always tricky. Good. Okay. Wow. Lots of discussion so far. It's really wonderful. It just shows what a rich field this is, a rich learning field. So Shall we continue with another uh, sutta on praise and blame? So this is from the Anguttara 4, number 100. So there'll be four points. Then the wonder Portalia approached the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. The Blessed One said to him, Portalia, there are these four kinds of persons found existing in the world. What for? Number one, here some person speaks dispraise of someone who deserves dispraise. And this and the dispraise is accurate, truthful, and timely. So there's some more hints. But he does not speak praise of someone who deserves praise, although the praise would be accurate, truthful, and timely. Hmm. So if we're always speaking the dispraise, but not the praise, <laughs> not only is it a bit one-sided, but it might also cause others to wonder about us, right? <laughs> and also the importance of speaking praise. Some other person speaks praise of someone who deserves praise, and the praise is accurate, truthful, and timely. But they do not speak dispraise of someone who deserves dispraise, though the dispraise would be accurate, truthful, and timely. <laughs> So being accurate, truthful, and timely is super important and having the discernment again, right? So I, I think this one's great because it sort of dispels any myth that Buddhists should only say positive things all the time, you know, that kind of toxic positivity that's that can happen and this feeling like we always have to be like really Pollyanna-ish and, you know, the world's wonderful because the world isn't and people's behavior is complex, right? And our own behavior is very complex too. So, and then another person does not speak dispraise of someone who deserves dispraise, although the dispraise would be accurate, truthful, and timely. And they do not speak praise of someone who deserves praise, though the praise would be accurate, truthful, and timely. <laughs> so they just sit there and say nothing. And uh, I don't know about anyone here, but I've been in meetings like that, especially in monastic groups. <laughs> and people just say, I don't know, or whatever. I go with the majority. And it's like, yeah, no, it'd be nice to hear from you. Um, I think that's really nice, actually, that everybody should have a voice, right? And learn to sort of uh, say what they see, say what they think, even if it might always not be. Uh, I don't know. I mean, here it does say accurate, truthful and timely, but sometimes we can't get it completely right. But again, I think it's good to give it a try. And then another person speaks dispraise of someone who deserves dispraise, and the dispraise is accurate, truthful, and timely. And they also speak praise of someone who deserves praise, and the praise is accurate, truthful, and timely. There are these four kinds of persons found in the world. So I think that's quite clear, right? One speaks the dispraise correctly, but not the praise. One speaks the praise, but not the dispraise. The other doesn't say either, and the other does both. So then the Buddha poses the question, now, Patalia, among which of these four kinds of persons seems to you the most excellent and sublime? Of these four persons, Master Gotama, the one that seems to me the most excellent and sublime is the one who does not speak dispraise of someone who deserves dispraise, although the dispraise would be accurate, truthful, and timely, and who does not speak praise of someone who deserves praise although the praise would be accurate, truthful, and timely. <laughs> so that's that image, isn't it, of like just sitting there, being quiet, not sort of giving your opinion. And for what reason? Because what excels, Master Gotama, is equanimity. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can understand where he's coming from. I don't know. We've given the game away, though, already. <laughs> so then the Buddha says, of these four, Patalia, the one that I consider the most excellent and sublime, and this is the Buddha, 
is the one who speaks dispraise of someone who deserves dispraise, and the dispraise is accurate, truthful, and timely, and who also speaks praise of someone who deserves praise, and the praise is accurate, truthful, and timely. For what reason? Because what excels, Patalia, is knowledge of the proper time to speak in any particular case. Hmm. So that's giving an even broader reason, isn't it? Even wider than the discernment in general and the wisdom in general, but actually skill in speech. Again, you know, pointing to that as a really vital part of the path that we can't just bypass and avoid. We've got to use speech, and sometimes what's not said is just as harmful as what's said. So we have to learn to use this tool that we've been given um, to bring harmony about in the world. Good. So I wonder if anybody else has any ideas on why that might be the case. I wrote a few little notes here, but I think we've discussed a lot of them, such as the courage it takes, the integrity, perhaps, that it takes the wisdom and discernment. So for the person who put the comment in the chat, the Buddha's praising you here as well, saying that that's even surpassing saying nothing at all. Because I think that whole idea of that being equanimity is also rather misguided. That's not really what equanimity means, right? To me, that's more like passivity. And sometimes that is mistaken to be equanimity. Yeah. Can we come to Bill? He's got some comments to make. Thank you. And I, how are you? I'm good. Thank good you. you so, and if a customer comes in, I'm, I'm going to have to. Oh, uh, you're in a shop. Off. I'm working. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Nice. I smoke cigars and I work in right. a shop. So. That's cool. <laughs> thank you. So I have a relative who's possibly going to die in the next couple of days. And there's a lot of tension within my side of the family. Doesn't like that aunt and cousin, which is in-laws to my mother, my brothers. And I have tons of information because I like that side of the family. For me to disclose details about what is going on with my aunt will fuel the gossip. And I, I, I can hear it now. I told you, she never took care of herself. Da, 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 da. And so, by withholding that information, it will come out, and then I will, I'm going to get pushback. Why didn't you tell me? Then I'm going to actually have to have, I don't have to, but have to kind of tell my mom, like, you hate, you hate this. You hate your sister-in-law. Why do you care? And by giving her that information, we'll just fuel her presumptions. And it just causes. So it, it, I'm just, I have to stay silent. I think is I'm way, because I know she wants to know, but her motivation to know is not in the best yes. interest. Yeah, I, exactly. I'm sure nobody on this, I'm sure nobody in this panel can relate to this. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's the human condition. You know, they don't like each other. Right, right. I think that's a brilliant point, actually, which is what I meant slightly when I said that, you know, be careful who you tell, like, make sure you trust them and they trust you. Because what I meant by trusting them is that they're not going to take it the wrong way and develop negativity towards that person. They're hopefully by talking about something difficult. Sometimes if both of you, if your motivation is to establish more harmony and to find ways to address the person skillfully or ways not to address the person at all, you know, and to have a boundary, then it is actually for the greater good, isn't it? Um, so yeah, well, but if you tell I'm... the wrong person and then they sort of start spinning out and developing more negativity towards another person, that it doesn't help at all. So I think it's, you know, this is all maybe part of what the Buddha means by um, timely and accurate accurate truthful and timely but always in our mind we should keep uh the idea of benefit right is it really going to be beneficial and yeah well, in well, some that, cases it might be better to avoid it for a long time yeah, that, that that is exactly my question no i don't i know my mother and brothers will want is 
information, but I don't know how beneficial it really will be to give it to Right, them. right. And as a practitioner, yeah, I mean, of... you have to think about maybe what is good for you, right? Okay, they want it, but is that going to cause you, yeah, dis-ease? I mean, do you have to be the person to give it? You know, and that is a question, I guess, <laughs> for you, well, because, because it's I... you going to take the the comma of that in a sense. So, you know, this is where you use your own discernment about what's good for you on the path. Sometimes we can be a bit selfish. I mean, it's okay to be so-called selfish and and not give that yeah. information because it causes us, um, we're, we're just not sure. I often think, you know, when in doubt, wait. <laughs> it's better not to do something if you're in doubt sometimes. Just wait and, and maybe there will be a time that it feels okay to share a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's yeah. I think I think that might be the best choice because if she does pass away, it will all come out of the funeral, and then I I, I can be absolved. Good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Can we come to Casey now? Hi, Casey. Hi, Venerable. Hi. I'm really glad to, to be able to join today. Um, as I said, I've been following on YouTube for a long time, so this is um, exciting for me to actually have the chance to, to jump in with a um, question. Um, I found it really interesting that the, the wander responded about equanimity, um, because I find that that's um, sometimes one of the most difficult things to discern, right, is the extent to which we, um, I guess, release or hold things of the world at, at arm's length, perhaps. Um, I, I'm actually, um, I mostly live in Laos. I'm visiting uh, my hometown in the U.S. now, but um, while I was at a temple there uh, last month, one of the, the teachers had said something about the goal of the practice being able to um, regard a, a rock and a chunk of gold with the same value. Um, and so it reminded me of, of this, of this thought that, yes, the goal is that we can detach, that we can um, not give, give a large amount of importance to something that perhaps doesn't merit it. But at the same time, I think it's such an important part of discernment to be able to see that in the world, a rock and a chunk of gold, they, they do have a different value and Absolutely. that there's no way in which we can use, use that. But I think yeah. speech is very much the same way that if we um, don't have any equanimity towards speech that is good or speech that is bad, then of course we get caught up in um, how that speech makes us feel or <laughs> this or that. Um, but I think that this is a really big challenge is to know to what extent then do we let it go? Or um, I remember a talk from Lung Po Cha from Ajahn Cha that talks about a monk that, um, you know, just stays in his kuti, even though the roof is falling in, he doesn't fix it because yeah. he's, just, <laughs> he's just meditating, he's just uh, doing his practice. And so I think again and again, I see this being one of the key challenges for discernment is actually discerning what is the right level of equanimity. So I wondered if um, you would be able to talk a little bit on on that aspect of discernment, because clearly, even for a wanderer, even for an ascetic, it's um, not an easy distinction no, to me. No, it's not. And I think it's partly to do with integrating practice into the world, you know, because it's almost as though there's a relative and a, and a sort of... Um, is it the relative and the absolute, or you could say the mundane and the kind of... Uh, there's the kind of reality that we have to deal with, right? Like a rock and a piece of gold are two different things with two different purposes. You don't want to use like a piece of gold for like, a, I don't know, for kind of trying to break something or whatever you might use a rock for. <laughs> um, and you don't want to use a rock to make jewellery with, for example. So, you know, obviously they have different uh, values, but I think the point of um, being able to remain equanimous of things is firstly when there isn't much of a choice. So, you know, for example, things come to us in life like, you know, pleasure and pain, say sickness and health. I mean, nobody in their right mind would choose the sickness, but we do have to sometimes learn to develop equanimity when there's nothing more we can do. But I think often people jump to the equanimity before they've really gone through the other Brahma Viharas. 
And in my understanding of the practice of the Brahma Viharas, they start sequentially. They start with metta, which is a kind of universal benevolence, like a friendliness, a disposition of goodwill. And that's quite general, you know. And then when we have that fairly strong, like it's quite a balanced approach. It doesn't sort of uh, choose a particular portion of the population. It's very um, universal. Then we can go on to the karuna, which has more of the suffering element involved so that we're more connected with people's suffering and that wish to um, the beings be released from their suffering. So it's a little bit more nuanced and more directed to a certain group. So the heart is like getting more in contact now with like the second noble, the, the noble truth of suffering. Yeah, the first noble truth and and the cause. And then we can go on to the medita to balance the compassion. So again, it's kind of a specific uh, way of using love to rejoice in other people's success. And it's as a result of all of this, in a sense, that we get a sense of equanimity too. It's not a, a kind of aloof detachment. It's more of an understanding that there are beings in the world who, you know, we wish well, there are beings in the world who suffer, there are beings in the world who, you know, are doing well, we can rejoice with their success. And all of this exists and coexists. But at the same time, you know, there's only so much we can do to help. We care and we try and, you know, have appropriate response to each category of beings, to each person we meet. Our response should be appropriate to their condition. But at the same time, you know, there's only so much we can do. And that's where the equanimity comes in. Like each person, you know, has to fare according to their karma, right? Each person will make the choices they make based on their conditioning, based on their background, etc. So at some point, we have to acknowledge the limitation of, what, of how much we can help, how much we can intervene. But I would say that it's really important to uh, practice action wholesome action first even in that example you gave of the monkey and the kuti i think ajahn Chah reprimanded them because he said you know you don't just sit in your kuti with half a roof you repair the roof you know and that's also something offered with faith isn't it it's something given with faith you know for the monk to actually practice and stay healthy so we have to we can't bypass our physical reality and and you know the the kind of day-to-day -day decisions we have to make but ultimately, of course, um, the practice is to be able to uh, maintain an evenness of mind, a balance of mind with wisdom to whatever comes and goes, you know, understanding these are conditions, they rise and pass. Um, so I don't know if that is directly related to what you ask, but um, I think, I guess I'm giving more of a, a, a sort of caution against going straight to the equanimity because I think mm -hmm. for many practitioners that's a temptation and that's often, you know, the, the advice we hear in meditation uh, retreats. But it's so important to be able to bring our, um, the results of our meditation and the actual practice of meditation to day-to-day -day life um, and be able to integrate that. Yeah, so I think... It's a, a great question and a, a long, lifelong exploration, really. Yeah. That. yeah. Thank you so much, Venerable. I love that that idea of the um, equanimity as a temptation. I think it's, it's yeah. very true, but not the way that most people always think of equanimity. Thank yeah, you. and even the word equanimity, I mean, it's slightly strange. It's a slightly strange English word that isn't really in common usage. So I think there's a lot of scope there for misunderstanding what it really is. Mm -hmm. um, one of the translations Ajahn Brahm uses, which is a literal one, is um, looking on or looking over. Like, to me, it's about a sort of being able to stand back and get a perspective. Mm -hmm. So upa is like up and uh, peka literally means looking, you see. So it's it's not um, staying rigid or kind of on feeling in any way. It's just, you know, from time to time, we're, we're very involved, you know, in our lives and maybe with our care for others. And then just standing back and getting the picture and just getting that perspective again so that we can then go back and engage wisely. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And I think that really shows why the Wanderer um, perhaps went right to Becca because of that. Um, you know, it's it's tempting to say, oh, the best thing to do is just to to not engage, to not speak poorly, not speak ill of anyone and not speak well of anyone and just to stay contained in ourself. But okay. that's that's yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Right and then, 
Yeah. And if we do that too much, we won't learn, right? We won't actually right. learn because we won't see those behaviors kind of dis uh, displayed or embodied. And I mean, I learn so much by watching other people and how they act. I learn more about how to be, how not to be, you know, the kind of behavior that causes me harm or doesn't cause me harm, the kind of behavior to emulate. So, yeah, we need one another. We do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Venerable. You're welcome. There's another question in the chat that I might yes. come to. I don't know. Does Shirley want to do a yes, lovely? It's, I think it's more of a comment um, or a sharing, but I was going to ask to read it out. Um, I had an experience with a professional who forced... Know, that, we've had that oh, sorry, one, Shirley. we've had that one. Sorry. I've gone too far. Connie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This has come at a good time for me. Last night in a work, drop, work group chat, a male made what, in my view, was a very misogynistic comment about a female who wasn't in the group. I felt I had to tell him it was extremely offensive and I thought perhaps I should have just remained silent. I'm guilty of speaking out. This tonight, however, makes me feel a bit more confident that I said the right thing at the right time. Wonderful. Yeah. I mean, some behaviors that are so ingrained, especially, and so sort of um, hidden to people with those maybe, maybe misogynistic, in this case, views, um, do need pointing out from time to time, because I do trust that most people don't really want to offend. They don't really even mean to offend, but sometimes perhaps they just don't realize. So, yes, I mean, who knows whether it was the right time? I suppose you have to know for yourself whether it's um coming from the right place for you and um you know what he does with that now is up to him you can't really uh control that in any way but i do think often that when we call these things out a person may think twice next time before they say it and um i remember actually really letting a couple of people have it big time before i was a non <laughs> um because they physically kind of threatened me like it was dodgy. It was like on a beach in India and there was no one else around and this guy flashed at me and I just shouted. I said, you know, would you do this to your mother, to your sisters? And I think I embarrassed and humiliated them. And I swear they're never going to do that again. I, I think and I hope, but I think they were quite scared actually. <laughs> and they kind of said, no, sorry, sorry. No, I wouldn't do that to my mother. <laughs> and, um, you know, it was a good thing I did. So. And it was interesting because although I, it almost felt like I was acting it, but I knew the level of like anger that I needed to kind of act out in order for it to have an impact because I didn't actually feel angry with them. I just felt like, what are they doing? You know, this is so off. Like they, they just can't do this to people. Um, so it kind of came from compassion in that case. So, yeah. I mean, I, I sort of say good for you. Who knows, though? You know, who knows? We have to be honest with ourselves, right? And we can refine it too. We can refine it. We're never going to get it perfect. And it's not always about not causing any offense, right? Because sometimes people might be offended, but it's still for their benefit in the long run. Like they might not like it. People don't always like things. Um, and the next one's actually about that. Sometimes things are not pleasant to hear, but it can still be beneficial. So, yeah. Very good. We've got um, 10 more minutes. I also want to say hello to Diana because I'm aware that you joined a bit later and um, I don't know if I've seen your face yet, but yay! <laughs> so lovely to see you. Really lovely. Yay. <laughs> a fellow friend from Massachusetts. Oh, so uh, yeah, I don't know how much uh, more we should go through. We could leave the last couple for next time because they're also quite rich. Any thoughts from the group? Because I don't want to kind of overwhelm you all with input, but it, we could probably do the next one. Okay, so I'll ask you for a quick display of hands. Who wants the next little paragraph? Put your hands up. Hello, Michanda. Uh, there was a question before from Bill. He's going to a monastery. and uh, I like think he wants me to answer that afterwards, Gunter. Okay. Good. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so anyway, who would like to do another paragraph? Hands up. I mean, your actual hand, not the thingy on the thingy. 
Uh, well, I think most of you. All right, I'm going to go for it. Because <laughs> it does uh, give some more richness to what we've discussed. So this is knowing what to say and how to say it. And this is from the Majjhima Nikaya number 139. I think, yeah, this is from the Aranavibhanga Sutta that I spoke of earlier, the one that talks about um, always talking about behaviours rather than people, talking about principles of Dhamma rather than people being good or bad, right or wrong. So I would really recommend, as a little bit of homework after this uh, ends this week, if you can get hold of that sutta and read the whole sutta, it's fantastic, one of my very favourites in the Pali Canon, yeah. So this is a little excerpt from that. So here it says, the Buddha is speaking to the monastics. It was said, one should not utter covert speech and one should not utter overt sharp speech. And with reference to what was this said? Here, monastics, one knows covert speech to be untrue, incorrect and unbeneficial. Sorry, when one knows covert speech to be untrue, incorrect and unbeneficial beneficial, one should not utter it. When one knows covert speech to be true, correct and unbeneficial, one should try not to utter it. But when one knows covert speech to be true, correct and beneficial, one may utter it knowing the time to do so. So that's quite interesting. That's about the covert. Here, monastics, when one knows overt sharp speech to be untrue, incorrect and unbeneficial, one should not utter it. When one knows overt sharp speech to be true, correct and unbeneficial, one should try not to utter it. And when one knows overt sharp speech to be true, correct and beneficial, one may utter it knowing the time to do so. So it was with reference to this that it was said one should not utter covert speech and one should not utter over sharp speech. So I think this gives a little bit more guidance as to how and when and what our kind of guidelines are for uh, the speech that we utter. And it's interesting here to me that, you know, even if it's true, correct and beneficial, we still have to know the right time to utter it. Mm -hmm. So it's not a kind of free license to just say what we think and what we see any old time, <laughs> you know, but it's really a guideline to uh, learn to know, learn to discern, and then also to ask ourselves these questions. It's like a checklist, isn't it? Is this true? Is it correct? Is it beneficial? And if it's true and correct but unbeneficial one should try not to utter it so we do have to restrain ourselves and i wonder bill if that helps you in this particular case you know it might be true and correct but if you it says no that it's going to be unbeneficial sometimes we can't know but we can have a strong sense isn't it um and of course even if we think it's okay still the right time so to me, the right time often means uh, waiting a bit longer <laughs> because my tendency, I guess, is to be more on the impatient side and sort of say things quickly and get through things quickly and kind of get things sorted out now. And uh, I think always having that pause is quite a wise thing to do, sleeping on something, you know, or like writing an email in your draft, keep it in your draft. And then look at it again when you're a fresher state of mind or when you're in a more positive state of mind and you might realize your tone was a little bit too sharp or you said more than you really needed to you can cut it right down um i wrote a little email to somebody the other day and uh, at first it felt as though i might uh kind of give more uh possibility to this person to do harm by <laughs> uh and then uh when I came back to it with a clearer mind, I realized it could be just very, very brief. I didn't have to give sort of too much away and I could make it very clear, very brief and just to the point, you know. And I think uh, that felt like a, a very polite but uh, clear boundary for me. So, yeah, Diana's asking covert, meaning behind another person's back. I think so. Covert, it sort of means uh, you're not saying it directly. 
to someone. Is that right? I'm going to ask Linda, who's sitting right here. Is that what covert means? It kind of means like you don't say it directly. It, it, technically, I think it means hidden. So I've hidden, yeah. I've been on that too. I think it's, yeah, I, I'm not 100% sure in this case what it's right. referring to. It could be hidden because obviously we we want to try not to utter things to others about others, but address it directly with the person concerned. But I think I wonder if covert speech might also mean hidden meaning, you know, that you're not being very um, I mean, this is just a way to that you could interpret it. Um, and what I'm getting out of this is to be straightforward, you know, uh, mm -hmm. Uju, suju, to be straight, to be direct. These are the qualities of the Sangha, um, and especially of the enlightened uh, people, monks, nuns, or lay people. Um, to be straight, to be very straight, to be upright, to be direct is an important quality. So you don't kind of beat around the bush and, well, I'm sorry, but you know, I think it might be better if. And this is quite challenging for British people, I must say because we're kind of taught to beat around the bush, like to kind of hint and not to say it directly. So <laughs> I don't know if that really constitutes covert, but for me, it's kind of, yeah, about being direct, being clear, addressing it with the correct people at the right time, you know, um, yeah, being truthful and correct, of course. So correct is interesting because we might think it's the same as truthful, but I think correct means get your facts right first before you do approach someone, you know. Again, be direct. I mean, if possible, you can actually call something out as it happens, which someone here has done, so that you are correct about it. You know, it's not something you've created in your mind later or you've sort of heard on the grapevine, but you actually do inquire, first of all. And that was a skillful means taught to me by one of my first teachers to never make assumptions, but to always ask, especially around others' intentions we cannot see inside another person's mind you know we might think they were being so mean or they were really they had it in for me i mean that part is what we had what did they actually do that was the problematic behavior you know and and can we take responsibility for our feelings and talk from the place of how we feel rather than what they did so on that um note i would just like to um mention this uh, method of nonviolent communication, which people might want to look into if they really want to take this uh, right speech practice into their lives with some useful, skillful means. It's very interesting because it, it teaches us to frame our um, experience more in terms of uh, our experience, actually, rather than what we're assuming someone's doing to us. Um, and that causes a lot less defensiveness in the person listening and a lot more empathy as well. So I'm just going to go through the last couple of comments because we don't have time to finish the chapter. But I think next week we might actually finish the part on proper speech and possibly start the part on good friendship, which I'm quite excited about because that's a really uplifting uh, chapter and we can rejoice in our friendships as well. So uh, here in the comments, it says, knowing the proper time was the punchline in the previous sutta that we looked at. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Knowing the proper time, really important. And no one's gonna tell you what it is. So <laughs> we have to learn for ourselves, yeah. And remember, you'll make mistakes and it's impossible not to, and even the Buddha upset people, right? So sometimes we can be a bit too hesitant to say things and, for me, that's impossible because I actually express myself, I think, out loud sometimes. So I get clearer on kind of my meaning through communication. Um, and I give myself a little bit of leeway there to kind of get to the point, you know, kind of clarify things with another one that I trust. Yeah. And Manori says covert could be secret, hidden, clandestine, etc. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, saying things and doing things without other people's knowledge. Sometimes you might have to if you are addressing a case of, say, abuse. You know, you might not want to tell that person that you're about to kind of, you know, collect evidence or whatever it might be. But um, obviously you want to be very honest with yourself about your motivations and, uh, you know, certainly not uh, do this to kind of bond with others, you know, or to kind of take sides against another form little cliques that's not uh, very nice so yeah 
Okay, I think we've come to the end of the session and uh, we're going to meditate now at Anukampa Buddhist Vihara. <laughs> there's a, there's a, a message here to me. Uh, let's reply. Uh, but I am thinking that it's a question for now, really, and I'm probably not going to have time to reply later because I tend to only have these allocated times for uh, Dhamma questions. I'm just too busy at this stage in the project. To, um, and also, I prefer to speak to people directly when I know that you're there, I can see your expression. So I'll just uh, read through this. I might not have much time to reply, but I'll read through it. If anyone has to leave right this minute, that's okay. Um, but I just don't like to leave anyone out. So I was wondering how one knows who is credible to listen to. I watched Ajahn Sona from Canada. He has a large following. I was wondering if his way is in line with yours. So firstly, I can't say exactly because I don't know him well enough. Um, so I think, you know, it's very probable that he's very similar because he's a Theravada monk. I don't know what his, I, I honestly, I, I do ask about people's attitudes uh, towards bikinis. I think it's probably not hardcore against, it's probably more moderate, if, if not supportive. I can't really say, but that would be something I would look at personally as a bikini and someone who doesn't want to cause harm with any sort of discrimination. Uh, I've listened to a few of his talks, which I really liked. Um, I don't know exactly how he teaches. I think rather than check whether it's in line with the hours, because we're also just mortals, right? Even Ajahn Brahm, <laughs> just about. Uh, I would check if it's in line with the Buddha. I would check if it's in line with the suttas, you know, whatever anybody says, any monk or non, any lay person, just check whether it actually accords with what the Buddha's teaching. And secondly, whether it helps you, right? That's really important. Is it leading to benefit for you? And uh, if you do find anything that's confusing or seems conflicting, talk about it with Ajahn Sona. Ask him, you know, what did you mean by this? This sutta says this, and you said that. Is there a difference here? Um, so yeah, I asked if it were possible for lay people to have a Dharma name as it would be something to aspire towards. Instead of saying yes or no, he gave me one then and then. I looked up the name and the only other is one from the Buddha's time who in her older age and sickness used her walking stick to climb a mountain and find enlightenment at the top. How wonderful. That resounded with me because I'm disabled and I feel like I'm climbing a metaphorical mountain and I'm on my journey up. Oh, that's really beautiful. What are your thoughts on being given a name as a lay person? I wouldn't want to use it if it's not right in your opinion. What are your thoughts? Your name has been given in faith. So please use your name to inspire you. If it brings you happiness, if it brings you inspiration, then that's really wonderful. You know, I think it's perfectly fine and it will remind you of your Buddhist aspiration. It will remind you that you're on this metaphorical journey up the mountain. And, you know, all of us are on that journey with you. We all have our disabilities in one way or another, whether they're physical or, you know, emotional. And let's not think of them as disabilities, but just different abilities, you know, and different strengths and weaknesses. And it's a hard climb, you know, so if it gives you inspiration. I'm presuming it's one of the enlightened bikunis and I forget exactly which one, but um, please do use it. Next time you can tell us your name, your Pali name, or this time if you have time. Yeah, Bill's asking, what is it if you wish to share? So please. If you wish, you may. And in the meantime, I will ask who is giving the Dana talk to give the Dana talk. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I hope the talk is not covered at the correct time and beneficial. Today's session is offered on a donation basis uh, in the spirit of generosity. Any contribution you're able to make is very gratefully received and will help to support memorable chandas, uh, physical needs, and the development of England's first uh, Theravada monastery where women can train towards full bhikkhuni ordination. Um, thank you for your ongoing support and uh, best wishes to Oxford, to our Vihara we have now. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for being in the Vihara with me right now, because we've done a lot of teaching from here, especially with Ajahn Brahm. And uh, every time we do teach the Dhamma or listen to the Dhamma or meditate, it just 
boosts up the vibe, you know. <laughs> Sounds a bit trendy, doesn't it? Boost the vibe. But there is such a thing as a good meditation atmosphere and uh, a peaceful kind of uh, energy in a place that starts to grow. And uh, I think some of my guests are already experiencing that when they come here. And I hope that you'll all be able to experience it too and share and help and contribute to make it strong. And uh, also by supporting uh, myself, if you like, uh, and by supporting the project, you're supporting other bikinis too. Um, I actually do have a bikini sister who's coming to visit me. In, and she is like a sister, actually not just in ordination, but we're, we're quite close. And so she's coming to stay with me as well. So you'll be supporting the growth of a bikini sangha and of course a community hub for all of us. So even though most of you are on the other side of the world, I do hope that you'll get here sometime. And, uh, and if you all get here, then we'll have to get a bigger place. So you have to come <laughs> and then we can <laughs> get a real forest monastery. So wonderful. Okay. So let's end this session and uh, we can wave goodbye. If you want to unmute yourselves, I think you should be given the permission around now and we will stop the recording and say goodbye.